It's a power we cannot imagine. Vicious weather, extremely hard rock, and avalanches all contributed to making the tunnel through these mountains New Zealand's longest road tunnel. It's a force like no other. Do it again. Vicious weather, extremely hard rock, and avalanches all contributed to making the tunnel through these mountains. With the seductive beauty that overwhelms us. With a cold that buries thousands in a white, silent death. Snow. It means different things to different people. To some, it is just a nuisance, but to others, it is a most awe inspiring substance. It's used for winter sports. Its perceived pureness is beautiful to observe. But to those that have been killed by snow, it's a grisly reminder that this beauty comes with a steep price. For snow has changed our world so much. It not only helps shape our land, lakes, and rivers, it also provides us with an endless reservoir of life-giving fresh water. We now know that our Earth isn't the only planet with this white crystallized water. Snow reaches throughout the solar system and to galaxies far beyond. Snow fills our universe, as well as our backyards, and covers much of the Earth, coating every surface it touches with an infinite amount of crystal designs that will perhaps never end. It destroys us and nurtures us as it melts, sometimes too fast sometimes too slow, sometimes too early, sometimes too late. Snow provides an endless string of mysteries and well-kept secrets. It's this hidden knowledge of snow and just how it affects your life that we will explore in a different sort of way, in deadly beauty, snow's secret life. It's a look at snow like you've never seen before. Back in the 1920s, deep in the rugged mountains of British Columbia, no one knew the depth of the deepest snow. The highest mountain had not been climbed yet. No one knew what really caused an avalanche to suddenly let loose. All that lay in the future. Since then, snow and the avalanche have claimed thousands upon thousands of lives around the world. A number that continues to grow as our love for extreme winter sports and snow recreation increases not only in the mountains, but in the flat Midwest plains as well. It's because of this growing affection for snow that we bring you a new perspective on this common white substance. Secretive knowledge from experts that will surprise, maybe shock you, and above all, educate you about snow. From many interesting aspects of mountain avalanches to strange red snow, even snow insects, plus many subjects in between, and even underneath.
Snow has a secret life in the sense that we look at it and we're not aware of anything happening. It looks like a white blanket, pretty homogeneous, uh, and it looks superficially, it looks the same day after day to us. But if we look carefully, uh, it's not only not the same, it's changing, but if we look in the snow and even on the snow, uh, underneath the snow, there's a lot of life. From above, snow may look lifeless, but as we'll see, life under the snow is anything but dull. Hidden away under this thick white atmosphere, secret activities take place, an entire world unique and important, but hidden from our eyes. The climate under the snow is pretty stable all winter long because once you have a couple feet of snow, even when it gets compacted and loses some of its insulative value, it's still enough to pretty much insulate them from the cold that's above the snow. The temperature that they're at tracks more the ground temperature, which is just around freezing. It's pretty dark, very little light goes down through much snow, and the temperature is not very cold, but there's quite a bit of activity. In this subnivian environment, which is the fancy name for the space between the snow and the ground, is important to small mammals, of course, because many are active in the wintertime. They're warm-blooded, so they like to be protected from severe cold temperatures, which they are under the snow. And there are plant materials under the snow that are still green in the wintertime, and they can eat those. And it gets to be some hoarfrost forms down there. And what happens is that water will migrate from snow crystals at the ground surface to snow crystals above the ground surface. The Inuit Indians recognized this because snow was so important to them. They called this pukak because there's no structural strength to it. You can push a stick through it easily and small mammals can tunnel around in this very nice environment easily in the winter. Weasels have this long skinny shape so they can fit into mouse burrows. But there's some animals that can hear them, like owls, for example, wolverines and pine martens. These animals will listen to the weasels and the mice and try to pounce right through it. Luckily, snow has provided a subnivian escape route. The fox has figured it out just seconds too late. Just like the many types of snow, Avalanches come in all shapes and sizes, from the billowing light powder to the giant slabs of concrete. All avalanches can leave a trail of death and destruction. The category need not matter. For effective communication be between people and agencies about avalanche sizes, there's a, a classification system in Canada called the uh, avalanche size classification. And there's five sizes. A size 1 is small enough that it wouldn't bury a skier or a traveler on foot. A size 2 is large enough to bury a skier. A size 3 is large enough to bury and destroy a vehicle. A size 4 is big enough to uh, destroy uh, 4 hectares or 10 acres of timber. And a size 5 is, is more or less restricted to the larger mountain ranges. And, those avalanches would be capable of, for example, destroying uh, 40 hectares or 100 acres of timber. Large avalanche. Otherwise, the larger avalanches that we worry about, especially uh, if we're looking at seeing damage to forests and structures and so on, uh, those are slab avalanches and they occur when the snow uh, pack has settled or developed enough cohesion through wind action or the snow can release over wide areas at the same time. The snowy months bring out many special adaptations of the creatures of the northern latitudes. It's these special animals that thrive in this crystallized blanket of white. Different animals look at snow in different ways. A big animal like a moose has got long legs for getting through it, and they can continue to forage all winter long. We have an animal called the ruffed grouse, common in the northern deciduous forest, and they will actually fly into deep snow on cold evenings where they will roost in the winter and then in the morning they will essentially walk out and fly away. Bears are not built for walking through snow. They're built for carrying fat so they add fat in the summer and just hibernate under the snow in the winter. 
So the way bears have adapted to snow is simply to avoid it. So if there's not very much snow, then the entrance to his den is open and it's just as cold inside as it is outside, sometimes 60 degrees below zero. But if there's a good covering of snow, then the inside of the den tracks the ground temperature. That's up around freezing. Grizzly bears are like black bears in that they hibernate in the winter, but grizzly bears have longer claws and they're better at digging. So grizzly bears almost always dig a den, whereas black bears often stay on top of the ground or get into a natural crevice. In a year when there's zero snow, the wolves are at a great disadvantage. The white-tailed deer, uh, which is uh, one of the primary prey for the uh, timber wolf in regions of the world where the, the wolves exist in, in reasonable numbers, are adapted to traveling over the snow, especially if the snow has some crust or is packed. The deer cannot escape so easily, and in fact, we oftentimes see deer during times of deeper snow moving into traditional areas called deer yards. And this is where the deer move as a group and actually form deep paths through the snow where they can move. That's the good news. The bad news is, oftentimes because they're traditional and use year after year, there's no food. Animal fur is not created equal. From snow repellent to color changing, the animals of snow are at home for many reasons. Some animals during the winter will have longer hair. The underfur will become more dense to provide them with greater insulation and ability to retard the heat that's important for them. One of the ways that animals adapt to snow is changing their fur color to match the snow. As well as changing the quantity and quality of the fur. Some of the animals that turn white in the winter and brown in the summer are a long-tailed and short-tailed weasel, ptarmigan, lemmings, and snowshoe hares. And even uh, common gray squirrels that we see running around in the summer in our backyards put on a winter coat that we can see. For example, weasels, they are white, not so much for camouflage in hunting, but for camouflage in escaping. A wolverine and a wolf are both predators, but very different. The wolf is built for preying on large animals with long legs, big feet, for going across the surface of the snow, whereas a wolverine is built more for investigating for small animals underneath logs that are a little ways off the surface or underneath the snow and they have a small head for sticking into crevices like that and special fur that does not have snow stick to it. And that's why people use wolverine fur on the roofs of the hoods on their parkas. Up in the Arctic where the snow season lasts so long, wolves have evolved white fur. When you get farther south where there's four seasons, they're more variable. You have black wolves that can blend into the shadows. You got white wolves that can perhaps have an advantage in the winter. There's a different evolutionary selective forces. Filming these scenes up close was both dangerous and took years to complete, but are no doubt the best avalanche images ever captured on film. filming avalanches is to educate the public and to give us all more insight, those that study snow, about uh, the dynamics of avalanches and what we can do to prevent them. To predict how an avalanche is going to behave if you're caught in one is like rolling the dice at Las Vegas. Snow acts differently every time. Each mountain has its own fingerprint, you might say. Different terrain causes the snow to act in different ways. I call an avalanche the white dragon. A few times in my life, I've gotten close to being touched by this dragon. If you were to be there at the time that avalanche hits the crash box, you'd probably be knocked out cold and just 
completely turn to soft mush because it would break virtually every bone in your body, so you wouldn't really have much of a chance. Fortunately, in some ways, people that get caught in avalanches generally get caught in them from the start zones where it first starts to crack and they're starting to slide down with the avalanche. They're riding with it on this white carpet. And if you're caught in something like that, the best is just like you're swimming, you're kicking your legs and swimming to stay on top. And because once it stops, it becomes like concrete immediately and you cannot move. Most avalanche victims that are caught within the first half an hour, they have a pretty good chance of survival. After that, the odds go down very quickly. It's horrid to survive something like that. And if you do, you're gonna have broken bones on the way down. I think about those kind of things too when I'm out filming. Fortunately, though, I work with avalanche experts that really are able to read the terrain and to understand the snowpack and the stability, and so the odds are very much stacked in our favor for safety. One of my main reasons for being involved in this project is to produce avalanche footage that, that does enhance public safety in the winter months. I think the more people see large, powerful avalanches moving down the hill, the better, because it instills in them a a respect for the mountain environment, for the avalanches that nature can produce, and possibly a desire to learn about the safety aspects. A lot of myths have been dispelled in the sense that skiers think they can outski an avalanche. Well, many of these dry avalanches are traveling up to 200 miles an hour. Not only does it take extreme safety precautions and snow experts to film avalanches, it takes the right equipment. These avalanche-proof cameras are installed in a steel crash box, a suit of armor that can withstand the deadly force of impact. They are carefully packed with shock foam, focused, and set into position. An avalanche can carry these cameras with their built-in locator beacons a mile or more before coming to rest. Recovering the buried camera and showing the film puts you in the middle of the action. Some areas under the snow are still shrouded in complete mystery. And while no human would want to be trapped under snow for even a minute, one animal doesn't mind. We are just now unlocking the secrets of the snowbound beaver and their unexpected cabin mates. Dr. Lynn Rogers explains. The beaver is actually a willing captive under the snow. And what is fascinating is that the beavers never see the snow. They're always under it. They're in a pitch black environment. They see the ice, but not the snow. They continue to be active though in this situation. They can hold their breath for up to 20 minutes. So they can leave the lodge, swim around, bite off a stick from their food cache, carry it back into their lodge where they can eat it. They are really built for this underwater, under the snow existence. To unlock the secret of what goes on underneath a snow covered beaver lodge, I put a tiny camera inside a beaver lodge with a cable that goes under the water 600 feet to my cabin. This shows what's happening inside that beaver lodge. To the beavers, it's pitch black in there, but there's an infrared light contained in this camera that lights the inside of the lodge, converts that infrared light to visible light, and that's what I see on my TV monitor. And I can watch what the beavers do all winter long. This is the first footage taken in the pitch blackness in the dead of winter of what goes on inside a beaver lodge. And I was amazed to find they share this space with other animals who want to take care of this wonderful structure that the beavers created. And to my amazement, a whole family of muskrats peacefully coexisting and working cooperatively to maintain the lodge with the beavers. People and beavers have a lot in common, partly how they adapt to snow. We build elaborate houses to get us through the winter. And they're heated sometimes with petroleum that we get out of the ground. And beavers build this most elaborate housing structure of anything I know of in the animal kingdom and it's heated from heat that comes from the ground. And here under this blanket of snow in the dead of winter, two mammal species trying to make it through the winter, cooperating is the only example I know of in nature.
beavers disappear for five months over the long winter in the northern regions. So do the insects. Or do they? Some insects have adapted to snow in ways that may surprise even the most avid outdoor enthusiasts. Now we explore some tiny creatures that are mysterious and complex. People don't see things like this because in many cases they're not looking for them. I can't picture more than one person in a hundred has ever even seen insects walking around on the snow. Because they occur by the millions. They look like someone has sprinkled the surface of snow with pepper. If they look closely, they see those flakes of pepper moving around. What is this so fascinating about seeing something on the snow? I just look at that and say, this is incongruous. You're not, you're not supposed to be here. It's, it's cold. One day I saw these relatively large insects moving around on the snow, which I thought was very interesting. I saw two of them mating on the snow, and I thought, aha. And I had temperature records from this area at the time, and it was minus 25 degrees below zero. I sent them off, new species. This is the first time the genus had been found in North America. My usual way to kill insects, because I don't like to use poisons, is to put them into a deep freeze. And the next morning, I took the jar out, and they were walking around. They're alive. They obviously have an adaptation to maintain activity under extremely cold conditions. Some of them super cool. Some produce antifreezes, and they don't freeze. It's one of the first things you're going to notice about insects walking around the snow, that they're, they're generally a gray or dark brown or a black, and that serves to help absorb the sunlight, so that will warm them up a little bit. The other thing that you can see is a lot of them are, are fairly long-legged. They keep their body up off the snow. If you go out into an old field, you see uh, stems of plants called goldenrod sticking up above the snow, and there are oftentimes round galls on these. Inside there is a small larva of a fly, and its normal state is to be frozen in the wintertime. It actually promotes freezing. How these cells can survive formation of ice inside the cell isn't known. A snow bank is a wonderful sort of a blanket of insulation. Snow fleas will climb up through the little spaces between granules of snow. Snow fleas are only a millimeter or so in size, and so they can, they can burrow down into the snow when it cools off at night, for example. The, the insect activity is going to be in the ground below it, and then as they come up, you're, you're going to be seeing them on the top of the snow. When you get to a, a side of a stream, the insect activity there is insects coming from the stream and then walking just on the surface of the snow. Again, people look at snow and don't pay any attention to the details of nature around them. For those people who never seem to tire of watching the raw beauty of an avalanche racing down a mountainside, here is a sequence that took over two years to film. We call it Into the White. is heading your way. There's no way out and no escape.
Water researchers say H2O already has a crystalline structure. It's this free-form crystal type structure in the water we drink that may be important to the health of all living creatures. We don't know much about the crystalline structure of water because we haven't been studying it. We've been studying what's in the water besides H2O. We've been looking for the pollution, we've been looking for bacteria and other things, not studying the nature of water itself. And look at how water organizes itself and how that organization changes. It's so difficult to do because the act of studying the water affects it. You put it under a microscope or you put it under a fluoroscope or you, any instruments that you use in, in water change it. And Jack Frost does it every year as it forms crystalline patterns that you can see. That is a signature of water. That shows the nature of what's going on in that water and the same water always shows the same signature. But different water always shows a different signature pattern in the crystalline structure. Nature turns water into snow because it's part of cleaning the water. When water is crystallized, when it freezes, of course, the bacteria in large part are destroyed by the act of water becoming crystals. The, the water inside the bacteria's tummy literally blows up. As these crystals land and then melt and turn back into liquid water, that actually turn the impurities in the water back into something inert. There's a study going on in Tibet where the people have been found to live to 120 to 130 years old. They attribute it to the special water that they're getting from the streams that come from the snow and the glaciers melting. It's bubbling and churning through the rocks as it goes down. It's going through what are called flow form. We know that water forms a tetrahedral molecule in six points. And that occurs because of the hydrogen bonding force. That's the basic crystal unit of water. But then these tetrahedral molecules link together with other tetrahedral molecules and form what are called colloids. And these colloids are what snowflakes are. And that is bonded together by the subtle electrical energy called hydrogen bonding forces. And that energy is enhanced or created when water moves. A still pond becomes stagnant, whereas a babbling brook stays fresh and you can drink it. And it's the same H2O in the future, I hope we learn to copy nature, because everything, you might say, is a crystalline structure. There is more to snow than meets the eye. It's made up of many crystals that form in random patterns around a tiny living organism. One of snow's many amazing little secrets. A lot of people would be interested in knowing why you need a biological substance to make snow. The bacterium that is used most commonly is called uh, Pseudomonas syringae. There are dozens of species that have been found that do the same thing. Snowflakes that we see falling have something in their center. Very commonly, this Pseudomonas syringae, which has formed the nucleus for the development of that ice crystal. The process to make the snow inducers is very similar to the process used make a lot of food products. Snow does not form without some stimulus to form crystals of airborne ice, which we call snow. If you can provide an artificial nucleus for the water, uh, then you do not need to supercool the water as much in order to initiate this ice crystal formation. In the fall of the year, we're very excited about being able to go skiing. Once the temperatures drop, we say, When's the snow coming? What we're trying to do is more closely mimic the natural snow that you have falling from the sky. And you might think, well, what's the big deal? You take a hose filled with cold water and spray it out in the air, voila, you have snow. You don't have snow. It would form a sheet of ice on the ground. It would not freeze in the air. Uh, what we're trying to do is get the largest, most open structured crystalline form we can which creates the best skiing surface. It has on its body surface structures that imitate the surface of ice. And there are several different bacteria that can be used, and we've chosen one that's relatively easy to grow in an industrial setting. So water molecules land on this, they think it's an ice crystal, and they begin to grow as a snowflake or a crystal of ice. And this particular bacteria is from tea leaves in Asia. And what these bacteria with the proteins on the surface do for the plant 
is that when the temperature reaches 32 degrees and slightly below, they will actually initiate freezing of moisture on the plant surface. This creates both a protective or insulative shell of ice around the plant and also actually drives heat into the plant itself. One of the first places this bacterium was discovered was uh, when they took samples of air out of clouds above the earth where snow was forming. They wanted to find out what was the substance that was forming the nucleus for the growth of these crystals. Uh, all of the bacteria used in the snowmaking industry is sterilized so that it, it's not living, it's not viable as it goes onto the hill. This element of nature uh, is important to something we look at as being only frozen water. Well, it was a big aha when I found out that bacteria could do this. Textures and colors of snow can be as different as the snowflakes that made them. It's these textures and colors that are the beautiful side of snow. If you were out walking across a field in, particularly in late winter, and suddenly saw this, this pink cast to the snow, you might say, am I, am I daydreaming or is there some light being reflected off clouds? But if you look carefully, in fact, the snow is pink. And it's pink because there are blooms of an algae that lives in the snow for short periods of time, especially when the temperature is high enough so there's a little bit of moisture for them to use in their metabolism. The most common, commonly seen color of snow that I've encountered is red snow, a simple little plant that uh, grows in the snow in the wintertime. The uh, scientific name has a, the, the genus Gymnodinium. It's related to the same algae that caused the red tides along the, the coastlines in the southern United States responsible for fish kills. The pigments we see are actually pigments used by the algae for photosynthesis. It's been observed, not just casually, but quite commonly, that snow is not always white, if you look. The art and science of avalanche prevention is ever growing as is our love for mountains and winter sports. It's the reason snow safety experts continue to do their best to keep you safe from the white dragon. Avalanche control is normally used where we want to uh, protect structures or a, a workplace uh, where people have to come and go or spend long periods of time. So what we do there is monitor the snowpack conditions uh, try and find out whether there are weaknesses within the snowpack that would respond to explosives and uh, allow us to close off an area or isolate an area and then trigger the avalanches. From the air, the rugged mountains are breathtaking in both their splendor and the danger they represent. Avalanches that fall here are a spectacle to behold. Avalanche control specialists never tire of watching from a safe distance. To do that, you have to first continue assessing the snowpack conditions, uh, try and decide when the snow is likely to fail, when you've accumulated enough snow uh, on top of weak layers that might exist in the snowpack. And we often do that using helicopters, where we can fly over the avalanche starting zones and prepare explosives, load them into the helicopter, fly over the avalanche starting zones, light the fuses that are attached to these explosives, and throw them from the helicopter onto the avalanche starting zones in uh, places where we think we're most likely going to be able to trigger a failure in the snowpack, making the workplace or the uh, recreation area safe for business as usual. Some animals have adapted in even more special ways. Snowshoe-like feet give these animals a step above the rest. Some animals live under the snow and they don't have to have feet that can go on top of the snow, like pine marten. But some animals have to make their living on top of the snow. The lynx, which is adapted for catching and killing snowshoe hares with this big snowshoe-type feet. Some people call it a snowshoe cat. 
Bobcat has smaller feet, so it sinks more into the snow. If you go by grams per square centimeter, the lynx on the snow seems to weigh only about a third as much as a bobcat. The feet of many of these animals will develop hairs that give them extended area for support in loose snow. Some animals are basically built with large hooves like the caribou so that the loading on that area is much lighter than we see in many other hooved animals. While some animals have specialized body parts to deal with snow, only one animal has the entire package. The snow leopard from China has all the high-tech snow gear. You see the same adaptations around the world that you do here in North America. For example, snow leopard. That's the lightest colored leopard. They're an ambush hunter like most of the cats, but they have this powerful musculature so they can leap far through snow. Once they spot their prey and they get in the right position, they are an awesome sight. Snow leopards have wonderful fur. They have deep, soft fur that is just wonderfully insulative. Adapted for cold weather living, yet it has this long tail, which you would think would be a big heat loss area. But look how thickly it's furred to reduce that problem. And their legs aren't particularly long. They're obviously an animal that's adapted for walking on top of the snow, hence the big feet. And they have the powerful muscles like any other cat that allows them tremendous leaps. While the snow leopard is perfectly adapted to deep snow, another animal is at home in the shallow dry snow of the windy and cold high Arctic. The muskox is a shaggy cousin of the bison. Just one look tells of its snowy evolution. And then muskox up in the Arctic where it's windy. There's no tree breaks like there is here. It's just high wind blowing the snow, making the kind of hard packed snow that the Eskimos can use to make igloos. Then you see the muskox up there with their long fur built to resist wind. If one animal epitomizes the snow, it is the great white bears of the north, an animal the Eskimos call Nanook. Dr. Lynn Rogers explains features of the polar bear that give it an edge over snow. Like other animals that live primarily in the snow, they have extra large feet, they have extra small ears to conserve heat. Polar bears have wonderful feet. They have fur on the bottom of their feet to help them grip the snow and especially the ice. And they have the sharp claws, not only for holding prey, but to help them get a grip on the ice sometimes. And they have an interesting combination of black skin with white fur that's translucent. And it channels the sunlight down to their dark skin where it's absorbed. Polar bear fur looks white to us because we're seeing in the visible range of light. But if we looked at it with infrared vision, a polar bear would be black. The white fur also might help them to sneak up on seals, which is their main prey. It's interesting when we see a polar bear wet that you can see through the translucent fur that acts like a fiber optic that grabs the sunlight and channels it right down to the dark skin where the heat is absorbed. Unlike a black bear that has black fur and light skin. Although polar bears are snow machines on four paws, undoubtedly the most beautiful white furred mammal is the Arctic fox. Arctic foxes have the most insulated fur of any mammal in the world. And well, they should, because they live on the top of the world, and they're small enough that they have a high surface to mass ratio, which means they're gonna have a high heat loss. And they can't insulate themselves using fat because that would make them too slow for catching mice. So they insulate themselves by having the best fur in the world. It's surprising how small the Arctic fox's feet are, but they live in this hard-packed, wind-blown snow area. They're such a light-bodied animal that they seem to stay on top okay. Arctic foxes depend on their hearing for catching mice, which means they have to have kind of big ears. That would mean that there'd be a lot of heat loss. We can see that they've compensated for that by having really heavy fur right on their ears. As snow has shaped many of the animals that share the earth, it also shapes the ground we walk on. The avalanche is one of the most powerful forces in nature. Reaching speeds upwards of 100 miles per hour, it can destroy everything in its path, and only a few victims live to tell the tale 
all of a sudden I felt uh, something hard and big hit me from behind. A group of us that had been skiing together for quite a few days headed up and ran into some other friends and everybody proceeded to decide where they were going to ski. We're really quite excited to be able to see the entire Rogers Pass area for the first time in a long time. Within the minute, as I was putting in my kick turn, that's when I, uh, I saw snow slowly pass over my skis. All of a sudden, I felt uh, something hard and big hit me from behind. behind. When I came to, I realized that the pain in my leg was from a dislocated hip. Uh, with my hands, I pushed most of the snow off and had trouble sitting where I was. It was still on a fairly steep slope. After a while of sitting on the slope, uh, we started hearing helicopters. Later that night, after coming out of the operation room, an RCMP a police officer came to let me know that uh, Shane had died in the accident. Didn't know quite how to feel about the whole thing. Not sure if I still do. Sun and warmth are welcome by most, but too much of a good thing can be a natural disaster waiting in the wings. If snow melts too fast or thaws at the wrong time, flooding will be swift. The prediction of both is critical to millions. Snow's slow or fast transformation to a liquid state is what a hydrologist's job is all about. Their forecast is one of serious consequences and timing. And there are a number of factors that get involved in dealing with the snow melt. Number one would be the frozen condition of the soil. Number two would be the soil moisture condition as you go into freeze up. Then we have to deal with the quantity of uh, water content that's contained in the snowpack itself. The other important factors would be how rapid a melt that you get and the type of precipitation you get during the melt itself. You can lose your snowpack pretty fast. As snow falls from above, it accumulates in endless piles on the cold ground. But sometimes nature is too generous. Wind chill factors dipping down to 50 below zero put a stop to most activity in our region. The roads were blocked just about everywhere. Winter's everyday thing, you know. And I had to shovel snow for seven hours before I could even get out of the parking lot. A major snowstorm. And once again, the region was blotted by the white of a blizzard. Schools were closed for the second day in a row. We've moved a few more days towards spring, and we'll get sure. there. We've made it before. By knowing the, the water content of the snow, it's something that we can determine how much water there's going to be as far as the spring runoff. Using water content measurements of snowpack is highly important in the predictions of flooding by the National Weather Service. As we take a sampling from different uh, areas around our station and it is filled and then we melt that down and we get a measurement of how much water content there is in the snow. It's kind of like looking at snow as a sponge. Contaminants, they surround us. We breathe them, drink them, and live in them. So just what's in snow after it slowly falls to the ground? Is it safe to eat? or play in. Nimrod, on by. Up. One thing's for sure, all that's white is not necessarily pure. Snow is a form of precipitation, of course, and a watershed drains into a lake. And snow falls on that watershed, and what is in that snow is called atmospheric loading. Snow can actually have a, a nice cleansing effect upon the atmosphere. That's the good news. The bad news, of course, then that snow falls on the ground and what happens to some of these materials once that snow melts, it may end up as a runoff into some watershed. And the elements or compounds that are attached then have the opportunity to become dissolved in the water or moved by the water. Snow has what's called a scavenging effect. 
on the atmosphere. It can pick up material that uh, I would call toxic garbage, which are being produced somewhere by an industry blowing around the globe, but in regions where there's snowfall, it will suck that out of the atmosphere and deposit it. And so when your kids are out there taking a handful of snow and eating it, could be very dangerous, could be fine. Salt is used in the wintertime to melt snow on the roads, and that flows off the road or is taken away from parking lots and deposited in, in specific areas, and that enters the water supply. Roadways are made by their drainage system, ditches to drain into lakes, rivers, and streams. So where that salt drains into that lake, river, or stream, it has an effect on the biota or the biological community there. If anybody walks around in the field in the wintertime, or even in urban areas, you see yellow snow. This is from uh, urination of uh, animals. Now scientists are beginning to gather samples of yellow snow in areas where deer live, for example. And by doing certain chemical analyses on that yellow snow, they can tell whether the deer are in a state of starvation or whether they're not starving. The other thing that we've learned over the years is that the surfactant or the soap that's put in with the salt sand mixture in some cases has cyanide in it. The surfactant is added to the salt sand mixture so that it doesn't clog up the dispersion mechanism on the back of the truck. You have to weigh the lives of your kids and your wife and your family against uh, polluting the water. Not all snow can be read from the air. Field work is critical, as snow formation is like pages in a book. Snow gives away information about itself, a history that can be read in layers. When interpreted and analyzed, snow gives up information that is vital to avalanche prediction. Carefully shovel down a straight six inch wide column of snow and cover one half with a tarp so illumination from the sun's bright rays aimed at its back will highlight the white snowy stratum with a vivid contrast, almost like a light box. Lots of light coming through here, that means the snow's uh, lower strength. In most cases, a little darker here, probably a little stronger snow. Then much darker, there's a very stiff layer. You can, if I poke it with my finger, I get quite strong resistance, whereas up here I get very little resistance with my finger. And down here, there's an old surface horror layer. And down here, lower down, we get a very nice, uh, stiffer, stronger layer, some snow that has gained some strength. But underneath that, we've got some old faceted snow grains that uh, have very little strength. Look at that, how it falls and falls away. This snow is very, some people call it sugar snow because it behaves a bit like sugar, but it's a faceted, large angular grains of snow that don't uh, bond well together and they form a very low strength snow layer. So we could, we've got potential for very large avalanches to happen. Sure, a great demonstration of layering, hey, Troy. Unbelievable, nice work. There is another dark side to snow. Each year, countless people lose their lives in snow-related accidents. As you will see, snow can be a real pain. Carbon monoxide poisoning, and brain injuries, every kind of fracture that you can imagine. Frostbite, falls, skull fractures, hip, respiratory illnesses, wrist and arm fractures from falling on an outstretched arm, sledding accidents. We see more uh, motor vehicle accidents in the wintertime. Oh, I think I might need your help. Knee, ankle, neck injuries. When there's been a new snowfall, we'll consistently see a handful of heart attacks coming along with that. It's obvious that snow is here to stay. 
we must learn to live with it on its terms. Snow can be as unpredictable as it is beautiful. Snow can also be as pleasant and wonderful as anything in nature, calming, quiet, beautiful beyond words, and just plain fun. Snow may also hold the key to new technology and advanced crystal design. All the while, it will continue to clean the air we breathe and the water we drink. Snow will continue to hold our largest supply of fresh water in its grasp, but it is melting now faster than it's being replenished. Only snow can reveal its long-term plan for mankind. In the end, snow will no doubt continue to give us as much as it will likely take away.